teaching this class for the last three weeks, so I am not a history person, and this is going to be pretty much oh, all history. history. Yeah, and so it's, you know, and the thing is, is that it, the, when we get into this kind of stuff in this section, like early history, history and theology are just, you cannot separate the two of them. Who said what and when they said it and why they were saying it at the point in time they were at is yeah. as important as what they were saying. Yeah. And yeah. so... Right, because you know, as you read, like, for instance, First um, John, yeah. he, he is imputing Gnosticism. Right. And so, you know, it would be proto-Gnosticism, okay, to be specific, right, but... but Okay, you're going to be specific. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> and proto-Gnosticism? Yeah, I don't want to. Okay, don't Proto-Gnosticism know. means that Gnosticism hadn't been systematized yeah. yet, so there were these yeah, kind of really ideas easy. floating around, and people were picking out ideas here and there. Which? I don't know. Okay. No, go ahead. Anyway, but, uh, yeah. But so that, and it's understanding, you know, like understanding the, uh, the times really helps with understanding Right. Um, and even just understanding Hebrew culture, for instance, mm-hmm. helps understand uh, the Gospels. And, right. Uh, so. Context, context, context. Exactly. Right. And so often we just want to pull out, for instance, okay, so I wasn't here for this discussion, but uh, we were doing Jeremiah 29 11. Oh, okay. And I know the plans, you know, the plans I have for you. Mm-hmm. And how we pull that one verse out and say, you know, which is a great promise, you know, but it was. Within context, it was a promise to the exiles right. that God has a great plan for them right. to come back to the land and to possess the land and right. to be His people. And so, and so, what? But we like to be for like seventy more years, right? Yeah, right. that's my plan. Right, right. Which was not like a fun plan, right? right. But so, what do we do? You know, we pull those verses out and we say that those are. Uh, yeah. And, yeah we apply, and, and yes, God is applicable. Right, right. His promises are applicable, but sometimes we need to we forget those, the, the context, and by forgetting the context, we, we kind of pull things out of it that, don't, that aren't there. Right, right. Yep, absolutely. But I like for God to be the way I want him to be, Renee. I know you do. So do I. So what do you. You can't put him in our box. So then, how, how do you answer a question like. Um, I'm going to draw a blank on where it is, but, um, um, I will put my spirit in them, and they will be my people, and I will be their God. That is actually a future. It is not fulfilled yet, um, because that it is, um, I just wanted to hear how you'd answer it, because most people apply that to the church. It's not, <laughs> because we aren't that way. It is a future. I mean, yes, God. We have our God's spirit is with, with you know as we as come into salvation, but into them, into them as a whole, as as a group, as a as a nation, that hasn't happened yet. That's yeah. for. Um, no, I'm. I agree with you. I'm a dispensationalist, but I know my covenant theology friends disagree. <laughs> we are Israel. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, for prayer. Since we're going over history, I'm going to read an ancient prayer. Um, when we pray this, I'm not, since someone else is coming in, I'm going to go. Yeah. There's a lot of people out today. They're out every week. I've never really heard them out today. Really? Yeah. I know it's out all the time. I'm easily distracted. Yeah. I guess I can. Then I kind of got on the spot. I'm like, what time do you guys start studying? And what time do you guys finish studying? Do you just play all morning? <laughs> he was like, no, we usually, he's like, I usually go from 9.15 to 10.15. I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, church is not play hours. Right, like, right. <laughs> he was like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> mom. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, I started, I wanted to give you the benefit of the doubt. I'm like, maybe she's not off week, because like last week, or the week before, it was like, they were over 20 until like 9.30. 9:30. I, don't yeah. even, I didn't even hear. <laughs> yeah. All right, so anyway, uh, as I read this, this is going to come from the martyrdom of Polycarp, and this is his prayer um, right before he was um, burned to death. And uh, so his prayer, parts of it have to do with being killed. Um, And so I I, want to, the prayer is a good general prayer, but those parts I think we want to think of in a um, Romans 8 we are being sheep as led to slaughter all day long in that kind of a context. So um, 
I'm going to read this as our prayer this morning. O Lord God Almighty, Father of your beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, although through whom we have received knowledge of you, the God of angels and powers and of all creation, and of the whole race of the righteous who live in your presence, I bless you, and because you have considered me worthy of this day and hour, that I might receive a place among the number of the martyrs in the cup of your Christ to the resurrection of eternal life, both of soul and of body, in the incorruptibility of the Holy Spirit. May I be received among them in your presence today as a rich and acceptable sacrifice, as you have prepared and revealed beforehand and have now accomplished, you who are the undeceiving and true God. For this reason, indeed, for all things, I praise you, I bless you, I glorify you through the eternal and heavenly high priest, Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, through whom be glory to you, with him, and the Holy Spirit, both now and for the ages to come. Amen. All right. Um, so, yeah. If I fumble over my words in this, forgive me. I, like I said, I can't stand history, or I'm not used to it anyway. I shouldn't say I can't stand it. I'm not used to it. Um, so we're going to talk about church history from, um, from the death of John to the, begin to the end of Nicaea, and then it's going to bleed into next week where we're going to talk about, which is really what, um, as I want to, morning, you're fine, don't worry about it. <laughs> That's all right. It's fine with me. Um, the reason I leave is not me. Well, it's like you're trying to make them go potty right before you leave. Yeah, it's so oh, like yeah. Santa's no more command. Yeah, it does not work. It doesn't work that way. But you're trying your best to make it them to have the best success they can with. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the next week, uh, this is basically going to be like an interim between what we were talking about as far as Bible scriptures about Jesus' deity, and then we're going to transition from here to the humanity of Christ and what was, how, how do we as Orthodox view the two natures, the two wills, the one person of Christ, and how, it, how did that play out in history? So... In order to get there, we've got to kind of backtrack and go over the history, and also I think it would help, too, to uh, talk about some of the terms that I use, not that you guys are probably unfamiliar with Gnosticism and Arianism. But, um, all right, so uh, Christian history, we're going to start with the death of the Apostle John, and the reason for this is there's kind of a, um, uh, particularly with John, there's kind of a, a pedigree that goes on where you have the disciple of a disciple of a disciple, and they have interactions with each other um, that have to do with their relation back to, back to the apostles. And so I want to start with John, and there's our friend John again. Um, he died in about A.D. 100, and some of these, you know, not only I, as we're going along and I'm saying the dates, um, you know, the dates are wishy-washy, so it's not exact, and so, on some of these instances, and this happens to be one of them, you have witnesses saying one thing and other witnesses saying another thing, so even in the specifics, we're kind of not really sure what exactly happened. We can just say, this guy said this, and this guy said that. Hello. No, it's okay. So John... Um, was spared a martyr's death, as far as we know. Um, I will give, you know what, I'll just lead this off, which is that it, with John, um, uh, maybe I'll, no, I'll say that after. Okay, so anyway, um, John died in about 100, and from two of the witnesses, um, he was spared a martyr's death and died of old age. Um, some people have, and I think, rightly attested that to being that he was graced because he was the apostle whom Jesus loved. Um, I would like to think of it that way anyway, but um, this is Tertullian, uh, he's a church father, and uh, this is what he says about John, how happy is its church on which apostles poured forth all their doctrine along with their blood, where Peter endures a passion like the, his Lord's, where Paul wins his crown in a death like John's, where the apostle, John the Baptist, where the apostle John was first plunged unhurt into boiling oil and thence remitted, remitted to his island exile. Uh, Tertullian's the only one that says that John was put in boiling oil, I, so we don't know if that's accurate or not, but he says that that's what it was and that he came out unharmed. 
So it's possible. I'm not saying that it's not possible, but since he's the only one, it's possible that it didn't happen to. Um, but, and that was supposedly the reason for his, why he was put on Potmos was because he didn't die from his execution. And so he was... Tert he's a, one of the church fathers. Now, Tertullian would have been um, writing in between, I want to say like between like 120 and 200. He had several books. He wrote, um, he was a, a, a very, very intelligent man. He ended up becoming a Montanist, which were, were heretics, but without getting into Montanism. They were, Tertullian was an ascetic. He lived a very, very holy life. He, lived, he abstained from a lot of things, and which the Montanists were also ascetic. And so that probably is, they stressed holiness. They would, if you got found of any sin, they would kick you out of the church. It was, yeah, I mean, it was very, very, yeah, very. No, uh, exactly, right, right. That was basically the question with them was, <laughs> right, right. And so Tert Tertullian, that, that's kind of the question, is because Tertullian was a very, very intelligent man, and m most people, it, they, they throw it on one side, which is that we either, there had to have been a reason within Montanism that we're not seeing, because Tert for Tertullian to go over to it, there, there must be some history there that we don't see, and there must be a positive light to it that we just don't understand. And, you know. It could be, too. It could be, too. But... The, by and large, opinion throughout all of church history has been how in the world could he have done that, you know. But he'll pop up a couple times through this because he wrote, um, a lot of these guys in the, old, in the church fathers, and their main state was writing against heresies. So he's going to pop up a couple times in this because he's got a couple of really big works. Um, Irenaeus, another church father, he was writing in the 180s to the, to the 190s. Um, he would be the apostle or the uh, disciple of Polycarp, who was the disciple of John. Uh, then again, the church in Ephesus, founded by Paul, and having John remaining among them permanently until the times of Trajan, is a true witness of the tradition of the apostles. So he's saying, uh, Irenaeus is saying, and he's got it on good authority, and I trust Irenaeus when it comes to things having to do with his pedigree, his, his apostolic pedigree. Um, there are a lot of things that I don't trust him on, like how he said that Jesus lived to be 50. Um, but uh, <laughs> he uh, also had... Um, he, uh, what's that? Say that again. Where did he get that he was going to live till 50? You have to realize that with some of these guys, they have a different mind. This is, this is a really interesting point to sit and think on for a while, which is that their views of... Scripture, their views of how we know church history came about them, came, came to them by different means. And so, like, you have, guy, you have a guy like Papias, who, you know, we would think, you know, the Bible, it's the written, inspired word of God. We go to the Bible for everything. And yet you have a guy like Papias, who he was writing in, like, the anywhere between, like, 70 and 110. So, I mean, he's in the apostolic age saying, I would prefer to talk to the apostles and the disciples to apostles rather than read their writings when you don't have a closed canon and you're not exactly sure and you don't necessarily have all of it, there are some people that say Justin Martyr didn't have any of Paul's works. It, and you're living so close to the apostles where you have people that you can meet that actually saw them and heard from them or picture yourself sitting in a congregation where they had been and then all of a sudden you get a letter from them. You know, you're sitting in Thessalonica and you get, what does Paul say in... Um, Second Thessalonians. He's talking about the Antichrist. Don't you remember I said these things when I was with you? So I mean, he's, it, he's even telling them, as you read my writing, think about what I said the last time I was there. So s some of these guys, they, they hear things and they're drawing in what they hear rather than just looking at scriptures. And so it, with that in particular, um, with the uh, Christ being 50, these are things that he got through hearing people and he kind of pieced it together. But, and so, yeah, it's, you know, there, there are things with these guys that it's like, you don't, you can't trust them on everything, and they're like a shotgun. They, they say different, different guys say different things depending on what they're dealing with, but, you know, it's just a, it was a different day and a different age, and you kind of got to have grace with that. I mean, even, yeah, speaking of grace, I mean, you read through the early church fathers, and they almost never talk about grace. 
<laughs> uh, not until I mean, getting to Augustine. But when you read the Church Fathers and then you get to Augustine, it's like a breath of fresh air because he sounds like a Protestant. It's it's very very strange because the Church fought the early Church Fathers. It's and the heretics say this and the er- heretics say that and it's very very wordy and they kind of talk in circles and. But yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway, it's okay. no. <laughs> I picked up this nice little book when I was at uh, Wheaton, the Apostolic Fathers, and it's got the. Uh, Greek on one side, and some of it, there's some Coptic and some Latin in there too, but it's the Greek on one side and the English on the other, and it's got um, Ignatius and Justin Martyr, and it uh, doesn't have Irenaeus. Irenaeus' work is five volumes long. Clement, um, Papias, there's a, a lot of these shorter ones. What's that? Yeah, all right. I read book, I read book five, and that was, that was difficult. But anyway, what's that? Apparently, he had a lot to say. Yeah, he did have a lot to say. They don't. They don't like the heretics. <laughs> His. Well, and right. that might be why. Because they were combating all that. That might be why that was. Because that's where the focus was. Yeah. It's not that there wasn't grace. Yeah. It's just that the focus. Oh yeah, sure. Was on yeah. the fact that we have to combat this false teaching. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what the exact reason was, but I mean, I would probably venture it just to saying that they didn't understand it. Or that. You know, they didn't understand the whole. I I don't think that had. Augustine taking time machine back that they would have said, oh yeah, we disagree with all, you know, they would have just been like, oh yeah, we all thought about it, it's just, you know, it's just not first on our mind, you know. Right. One of those kind of things. But, in their culture. Right. Mm-hmm. right. So, okay, so after John, we have Polycarp, and um, you, we prayed Polycarp's prayer that he supposedly uh, prayed um, before he was lit on fire. Uh, Polycarp was the disciple of John, and he was the bishop of the Church of Smyrna, which is in Turkey. Um, there's a possibility, depending on how you read Revelation, the seven angels to the seven churches. I don't take them as being angels, and my reason is basically because one of the churches they're told to repent, and if that's an angel, why would they repent? Um, I, I think that it's better translated messengers of the Church of Smyrna. There are some people that believe that he's the angel to the Church of Smyrna because he would have been living at the time. He was a disciple of John. John would have been, he would have been known to John. Um, he was um, a, a godly man, and he was burned at the stake. He was threatened with lions and said, bring them. And he was threatened with fire, and he said, Lit, light it. And uh, he was, and oh, we're actually going to read this. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, there, there are some other... Uh, who was it that I read? Um, one account says, oh, it actually might have been the martyr of Polycarp. I might have read it there. That uh, he was not, his body was not consumed by fire, so they stabbed him to death, <clears throat> which is why the guy has the sword raised there, even though he's lit on fire. And maybe it happened, maybe not. Uh, the proconsul tried to persuade him to recant, saying, have respect for your age and other such things as they are accustomed to say. Swear by the genius of Caesar. Repent. Say away with the atheists. These guys are smart. I love these guys. Um, yeah. So Polycarp solemnly looked at the whole crowd of lawless heathen who were in the stadium, motioned towards them with his hand and said, away with the atheists. So rather than saying away with the atheists, because the atheists, the Romans considered Christians to be the atheists. And he's saying all of you are the atheists. Away with you. Um, but when the magistrate persisted and said, swear the oath and I release you, revile Christ, Polycarp replied, for 86 years I have been his servant and he, has, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? And uh, that's when they threatened him with lines and he said, bring them. And then they threatened him with fire and he said, go ahead. And so they, uh, they burned him. He, he uh, prayed and then they burned him. Um, now, Polycarp, uh, why are we bringing up Polycarp? And that's because, like I said, there's, a, uh, there's kind of a lineage to things. And I, know, I want you to understand who Polycarp is, where he comes from. He was John's disciple. Um, Irenaeus is writing about Polycarp because Irenaeus grew up in Polycarp's church in Smyrna. Irenaeus was, um, he was the bishop of Lyons in what would have been Gaul at that point. 
Um, and Ir and he, Irenaeus says that Polycarp met this man named Marcion, who is the, and I've been dying to say this all day, he is the arch-heretic Marcion, because <laughs> that's how they always refer to him. Marcion uh, had his own specific kind of um, Gnosticism. And so this is what Poly or Polycarp said to Marcion. Irenaeus relates that they met him. Uh, Polycarp himself replied to Marcion, who met him on one occasion, and said, Marcion said, Dost thou know me? And Polycarp replied, I do know thee, the firstborn of Satan. Um, what's that? That sounds like something my husband And these guys, what did I do with The funny thing, oh, did I hit escape? What did I do? Yeah, um, Oh, it's okay. Um, see if I can find this. Yeah, they are. Oh, they do not pull their punches. The church fathers, they have, they have no problems calling people heretics and saying that they're the spawn of Satan. And we should be more like that. Yeah. Well, go sit in John MacArthur's church. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he has no problems with it either. Um, uh, I'm not going to be able to find it. Anyway. Um, Oh, yeah. Is that the one in uh, Kentucky? Yeah. 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 Oh, we were. That's what I was pointing to you. Why does this sound familiar? He does that. Anyway. Um, so, uh, from the earliest of times, they were. The, the important thing to realize is that from the earliest of times, Christians, the who we would consider Orthodox Christians, were very easily pointing out the people that were considered to be heretics. Um, Bert Ehrman, who I picked up this lovely book. I love it when you, bump, when you go to Christian places that don't know who's on their shelves. Um, I was at the Joliet CYC back when it was still mm -hmm. in operation. Oh, it's and, been in operation? Oh, no. Yeah, they've been, they've been out for a long time, unfortunately. Yeah, we have, I haven't even been down there. Yeah, I grew up around the CYC, so I was there through high school and college and everything. And yeah, yeah. They, had just, oh, they just had rooms filled with junk where they were just oh. wouldn't throw things away. And um, they had up in one of their, like, it was like a tech closet, had all these, like, old electronics and stuff. They had this shelf of stuff, and they were trying to get rid of stuff. And I saw this, and I was like, I'll take that. And it's Bart Ehrman, who happens to be the number, like, one of the number one leading New Testament critics and is an agnostic and an atheist, or agnostic and a apostate. Um, and that was sitting on the shelf there. <laughs> they probably had no idea why that was there. I found some other, a couple other decent things. I found some uh, John Walvords on uh, Revelation. It's on, correct, collect, on cassette tape, and so I haven't listened to them. But um, <laughs> what's that? It's harder to listen to stuff on cassette tape. But Bart Ehrman, actually, Bart Ehrman went to school with my mom. My mom actually was in classes with him at Moody. Um, but anyway, uh, so these guys are guys like Bart Ehrman are looking at. And this is a, a big thing that's going on now, and I'm actually going to put uh, a quotation from Ehrman up there. Um, they're looking at the old church as being, you've got Christianity, which is just this giant melting pot of views. And there is no such thing as orthodoxy. There is no such thing as heresy. It's just orthodoxy is what wins, and heresy is what doesn't win. And so... That's like when you're going to watch the History Channel and you're going to hear things from like the Jesus Seminar or they're going to have guys like Bart Ehrman on there. That's basically the viewpoint that they're coming from is that orthodoxy, and I forget the name. There's a specific name to it. <sighs> anyway, um, that orthodoxy is essentially just what wins, and so there is no, you know, no pure uh, Christianity. But I mean, you have these witnesses from the earliest times where they're – they're saying things that are completely in line with scriptures to the deity and the humanity of Christ. They're recognizing who the heretics are. They're recognizing them based, based off the things that the apostles are saying. So like we went over a few of those things, like Paul in Colossians 1 is talking about the play Roma, which is Gnostic. So why is it that when you come upon a Gnostic that someone like Polycarp is going to say, firstborn of Satan. Well, it's because he recognizes it from the writings that he's got. He recognizes it from the teachings that he's got. 
So, I mean, that whole theory just completely falls apart, and there's obviously more issues with Ehrman than just that, but he's very, very, very sympathetic to the Gnostics and sees them as just a, a strain of Christianity that just more or less didn't make it. Um, so uh, Marcion, uh, 80, 85 to about 160, uh, this picture, and I don't know the history behind this picture or not, but that's the Apostle John with the halo there, and that's Marcion that's sitting with him. I, I, you know, I looked through, I looked through Eusebius, I looked through Tertullian, I looked through, um, a lot of my stuff is coming from Philip Schaff, and I couldn't f find where Marcion sat with John, so I don't know where this picture comes from, but. Didn't John die when he was 90 years old? Uh, there's, we're not told exactly, he was a, about AD 100, we're not sure exactly. He I mean, he John was more like in could have been. 15. Yeah, I mean, he could have been. He would have been a young man. So, but I mean, some of, like I said, you know, some of these dates are, we don't know. I mean, he could have been, for all we know, he could have been born in seventy five. Uh, John could have died in ninety ninety five one oh five. I mean, yeah. you know, you're not exactly sure. So, <clears throat> um, so oh, I didn't put it so it comes up in points. I wanted to do. Two, two, uh, <laughs> oh well, uh, he was uh, the son of a bishop of, in Sinope and Pontus, and he was excommunicated by his own father because he was a Gnostic. Uh, he arrived in Rome in about 140 to 155. So he was Rome was not Christian. It was not at at that point not necessarily anti-Christian, but it was more the big melting pot. And it wasn't Gnostic either, but it was accepting to Gnostics. And um, so he was coming at the same time of a guy we're going to see in a little bit, Valentinus. I'm going to watch my time here. Um, Valentinus, who was also a Gnostic, and they were spreading these ideas in Rome. Um, <clears throat> so against him, there's Marcion there. I don't know where that comes from, but... Um, Three guys who are who are mainly who are going to write against Marcion are Justin Martyr, um, Justin the Martyr that wasn't his last name, uh, who lived eighty. You can see their dates there. Uh, Irenaeus and Tertullian, uh, three of the Church Fathers who are writing against heretics, who Ehrman is going to call. Uh, <laughs> I had a good chuckle at that one. He calls them heresiologists or heretic hunters, because obviously he is biased towards the heretics. But um, so these guys are writing large works. Irenaeus has a five-volume set called Against Heresies. Um, Justin Martyr has his um, uh, his Apologies, which is a few volumes. Uh, Irenaeus or uh, Tertullian, I think, has two volumes on two vo two volumes on Against Marcion. I think. I'll hold me to that. I have to look it up. Um, so Marcionism, they're Gnostic. But uh, they're more rational and less of the mythical quality. So they don't believe in the eons. They don't believe in the Pleroma. They don't believe um, in uh, this very mystical kind of special knowledge gnosis thing, which we'll get to after. Um, they, he is primarily dualistic. So he sees... A distinction between the law and the flesh, or the law and the um, law and grace, and the flesh and the spirit. The flesh is bad. The spirit is good. Law is bad. Grace is good. And so he's also going to see the Old Testament not good. New test parts of the New Testament good. Um, he's got his three principles here: the Christ, who is the benevolent one; the demiurge, which is the world creator. Um, so basically the God of the Old Testament, uh, the righteous or wrathful one, and then there's the world of matter where Satan rules. Um, so he's drawing these kind of, uh, these dualistic principles between spiritual, between good and evil, and it's kind of just like, where are you getting all these things from? It's kind of arbitrary, you know? So he doesn't have any real reason for why he's doing that. He's just doing it because it appears good to him, and he's obviously... Uh, a Gnostic, so that's going to work out well for him. Um, let's see, Marcion, uh, he created the very first canon, so he is the first person that we actually have a 
list of acceptable Bible books from. And it's because of him, really, that we have the Bible books now that people started saying, hey, we need to figure out which books that we're accepting, which books we're not accepting. Um, so uh, according to Irenaeus, he mutilated the Gospel of Luke. Um, I, I, that is written. I don't know. Oh, all, it's supposed to say, all that is written respecting the generation. <laughs> yeah, it's probably copy-paste. All that is written respecting the generation of the Lord and setting aside a great deal of the teaching of the Lord in which the Lord is recorded as most clearly confessing that, that the maker of these, this universe is his father. So um, he's chopping out portions of the Gospel of Luke based on, he's getting rid of the parts that say that he was incarnate because he's going to be a, 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 a descetic. He doesn't believe that Christ had an actual body. So he's going to remove the parts that have to do with the, um, uh, the incarnation. Uh, he's removing parts that are very... Old Testament in nature, things that have to do with the, uh, the, Old Testament, the Old Testament God. When I say that, understand that I'm talking from his point of view. Um, viewing the Old Testament God as being his father because he's seeing them as two gods, two separate gods, and they're warring against each other. Um, he only has 10 of Paul's letters. Now, we're not sure why. Here's what Schaff says. He rejected the, the pastoral epistles in which the forerunners of Gnosticism are condemned. The Epistle to the Hebrews, Matthew, Mark, John, the Acts, the Catholic Epistles, and the Apocalypse. Um, why he got rid of the, or why he didn't have the pastoral epistles, it's possible that he just didn't have them at this point. I mean, that's always a possibility. Schaff seems to think it's because Gnosticism was condemned in them. That's a possibility, too. That's always a possibility. Um, but then he's also, uh, Hebrews obviously would have been out because of all the Old Testament references. The Apocalypse would have been out um, John, too much heat, too much Old Testament, you know. Um, so yeah, he's very, you know, since he's seeing Christ as good and Jehovah as bad, he's going to get rid of as much as the Old Testament as possible, and uh, even in the New Testament. Uh, he was ascetic, so no wine, no meat, except for fish, no sex. Um, even, and he allowed... Married couples to be baptized given that they took a vow of chastity at their baptism. Um, he was descetic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he was descetic, um, which uh, docetism, uh, that comes from the Greek word dakeo, which means to seem or to appear. So he says that. Christ only appeared to have a physical body, but he actually didn't, which is going to be contradicted by uh, particular 1 John and some of the things that Paul said, and we went over Colossians. Um, that has to do with it, too. Uh, he asserted that Christ had no physical body. Because the flesh is evil, obviously, and we're all trying to escape the flesh. Um, now, some Gnostics, um, you know... Most Gnostics are going to be ascetics because they're going to deny the flesh. Some Gnostics are going to be um, hedonists, though, on the other end. They indulge it to the point because they hate their flesh so much that they just indulge it, indulge it, indulge it because they know it's terrible for them. Uh, next part of Gnosticism is Valentinian Gnosticism. So we're talking about a man named Valentinus. Uh, he's about AD to 160, 8100 to 160. So he's living at about the same time as, um, as Marcion. Uh, another arch heretic, there he is there, supposedly. Um, <clears throat> he was probably from Egypt, from, Al from uh, Alexandria. Claimed to have been a disciple of Theotis, a disciple of Paul. And he was written against by several people, um, in particular Irenaeus is who is really writing against him. And this is when you have... When people explain Gnosticism in a more general sense, they're really talking about Valentinian Gnosticism. He is the major proponent and the major um, writer of, or the major systematizer of Gnostic beliefs. Um, Hippolytus claims his system is not constructed out of the scriptures, but out of the Platonic and Pythagorean tenets. So, what Hippolytus, Hippolytus is another church father. He's writing in the 3rd century, 3rd or 4th century. Um, he's claiming, unlike some people, they, there is a, where did Gnosticism come from? There are all different views. They say that it could have come from it, uh, the east, from India, 
because they're dualistic views. Uh, it could have been come from far from the West. It could have come from Greece because of Plato. Hippolytus is going with the Platonic and Pythagorean issue, which is we kind of talked about Plato's views a little bit, which is that you have the world or the world of matter and the world of forms, right? Do you guys remember that at all? Do I need to explain that more? No. Okay. Um, so Plato taught uh, that there were two worlds, that there's the world of matter, so there's this world here, and then there's this kind of the spiritual world. It's, not a, it's a real world, but it's a spiritual world, a world of forms. So um, this is a cup. Uh, this cup does not represent all cups, and yet it is a cup. So it's not a perfect cup, and that idea of cup, though, resides in the world of forms. And you can say that about anything, this table. This table is not the same as that table over there. It's not the same as this table here or that table there. But they are all tables because they all represent this idea of tables, which, which is this perfection that exists in this, um, this world of forms. So Hippolytus is taking those and he's seeing this dualistic nature and bringing the two of them together and bringing that into this and saying that this is where uh, Valentinus' Gnosticism is coming from. It's from the result of... Um, um, uh, Greek uh, Greek philosophy. Um, he taught in Rome at about uh, 140 to 154 and was excommunicated and then died at Cyprus uh, in AD 160. So yeah, he got kicked out of the church. But uh, these guys are very, very, very influential. And they were considered, uh, Justin Martyr said that Marcion was the most dangerous heretic that had ever lived up to that point. Um, they were had a wide range of influence over people. And, I mean, you can see just even um, in the, you know, what we call the proto-Gnosticism in the New Testament, you can see that this was an issue that, they saw, that the, the apostles were dealing with as well. It was very, very important to them. Um, um, as far as, I mean, it, these things... And these things still come up. These things still come up, not just as far as people accepting Gnosticism, but um, one of the, if you ever want to really hit someone in the ribs theologically, you know, just accuse them of holding to some Gnosticism and then draw some kind of a loose connection between the two. Because uh, that, uh, that seems to be a kind of a staple, depending on, and it always comes from both sides, and that's fine, but... Um, yeah, so uh, there's, there's um, and the, the idea is that there's always, no false religion is always 100% wrong. There's always going to be things that kind of tie in, and that's where you get dragged off. Um, so here's what Bart Ehrman says about Gnosticism, in particular about um, Valentinian Gnosticism. Since the mid-20th century, when Gnosticism has become better known, uh, we didn't know what the Gnostics had actually written until, like, 1945, something like that. We, the only writings we had of the Gnostics was where they were quoted in the Church Fathers. So um, guys like this obviously drool over this stuff, and you can go find it in Barnes & Noble and everything. Uh, it's the uh, Nad, Hamara, Nad Hamadi books, I think is what it's called, Nad, Nad Hamadi books or something like that. I could find it for you, whatever. Um, but they were a collection of books that were found in, I think, like Egypt. Some guys digging for fertilizer, according to Ehrman, um, found them, and they're just their works of Gnostic, Gnostic writers. Weird, weird stories. Weird stories. Um, uh, let's see. Let's just start over. Since the mid twentieth century, when Gnosticism has become better known, the Gnostic religions have sounded a resonant chord among many people in the modern world. This is a religion that makes sense to people who feel that they don't belong here. They feel that they are. Living, <laughs> living an alien existence. I, I'm seriously writing this at like 2 in the morning. Um, living an alien existence that they are not part of this world and that this world doesn't make sense to them. People who feel like they're trapped here, that in fact they belong somewhere else. People like that resonate with the Gnostic religions because that in fact is what Gnosticism itself teaches. So Gnosticism is teaching, uh, the word gnosis comes from the, is the word knowledge in Greek. And the idea is that... Um, through this secret knowledge, and it's not like a, like a phrase or a code or something that you can go to and read books or anything. It's some kind of an esoteric knowledge. Um, it's a spiritual knowledge, and when you come to that knowledge, then you can escape the world of matter and ascend to the spiritual world. 
Um, so it's all very secret knowledge, secret religion. Um, Valentinus, they start with the one God, the Proarche, the Propator, the Bythos, um, eternal, unbegotten, invisible, incomprehensible. And so you can see, I mean, even in that, it sounds a lot like what we believe, huh? <laughs> uh, and if you remember correctly, too, um, I brought up that open theist that was responding to me, and he charged me with being a Platonist because they deny all those things, right? Well, they well they're going to say invisible and unbegotten, but inco- the incomprehensible for them is uh uh-uh. that's a big no no for them. And they look at us and they say, um, you, know, you know, that we're deriving our beliefs from Gnosticism and from Greek philosophy because this idea of the unmoved mover, or the idea of a um, um, <laughs> it stopped recording, didn't it? Oh, no, it didn't. The uh, idea of, oh, good. Um, the idea of um, an in, in, uh, incomprehensible God that's not part of this world, they're going to see that as having something to do with um, this Greek concept of him not having anything to do with the, the world, the material world, because this world's evil, which has got nothing to do with that. And we get that from the scriptures, you know, but um, from the Bithos uh, emanates 30 eons called the Pleroma, so remember we talked about that word in Paul and about how Paul uses it to refer to Christ, he is the, the, in him the fullness of deity dwells bodily, so he's writing against the Gnostics, or the, the proto-Gnostics, against the Pleroma, because Christ makes up these 30 eons, he is the fullness of deity, um, and he's also saying that Christ had a body too, so he's both God and man. Uh, and then from these eons came Jesus, and I'll read you. Uh, here's what Irenaeus says. Uh, then out of the gratitude for the great benefit which had been conferred on them, the whole Pleroma of the eons, Pleroma means fullness, and in case you forgot, of the eons, um, with one design and desire and with the concurrence of Christ and the, and the Holy Spirit, their Father, also setting the seal of his approval on their conduct, brought together whatever each one had in himself of the greatest beauty and preciousness. Uh, and uniting all these contributions so skillfully to blend the whole they produced to the honor and glory of Bithus, a being of most perfect beauty, the very star of the Pleroma and the perfect fruit of it, namely Jesus. To him they also speak of under the name of Savior and Christ and patronomically Logos and everything because he was formed out of the contributions of all. And then we are told that by the way of honor, angels and of the same nature as himself were simultaneously produced to act as his bodyguard. So um, Jesus is one of these eons, and um, these eons, um, there's 30 of them, and their names are Christian names. Um, There's one named life, there's one named knowledge, there's one named um, um, beginning, there's one named father, there's one named savior, there's, you go through the list of them, and there's lots of Christian names in there, and they're being given to these eons, these angels. Um, And so Gnosticism, in that kind of respect, Gnosticism is kind of like an amoeba. It it sucks in other religions, and it saw Jesus and kind of, yeah, we'll take him and we'll make him one of ours too. And so there's, like I said, Gnosticism, one of the reasons why I did not want to study for this at all and why I took the last three weeks studying for this and was still up till four o'clock last night reading, um, because Gnosticism is... There's Jewish Gnosticism, there's pagan Gnosticism, there's Christian Gnosticism, there's Marcionite Gnosticism, there's um, Simon Magus Gnosticism, there's um, Valentinian Gnosticism. It's very diverse, very, very diverse. Um, So the result of the Gnostic controversies, and here's where we can kind of start making some head some time here. so, because of the Gnostic controversies, uh, Christians had already admitted to the deity of Christ on Polycarp. Read that to you, Polycarp two twelve two. Did I have that here? Um, Polycarp twelve two um, specifically states the deity of Christ. That there's Polycarp to the Philippians. I shouldn't say Polycarp twelve two. It should say Polycarp Epistle to the Philippians. Oh, I opened right to it. Um, 
Now may the God of the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the eternal high priest himself, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, build you up in faith and truth and in all gentleness and in freedom from anger and forbearance and steadfastness, in patience, endurance, and purity. And may he give to you a share and place among his saints and to us with you and to all those under heaven who will yet believe in our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, and in his Father who raised him from the dead. Um, um, and unfortunately, it's not, this quotation is not in Greek, it's in Latin. So I wanted to, when I first got a hold of this, I wanted to see it in the Greek because I wanted to see if he uses the same construction that Peter uses in one one that we talked about, the Granville Sharp construction. But it's in Latin, unfortunately. So I don't know if he did or not. Um, but either way, uh, they're admitting to the deity of Christ openly. Um, even with the Gnostics, they believe Jesus was God or some form of a god. You know, they're not denying his deity. Uh, they had fully defended the full humanity of Christ. So the Gnostics, remember the Gnostics are descetic. They don't believe that Christ was really human. So as a result of this, we have a Christ who has a real body. He is, he is, a, he is truly a human. Um, and from here, they're moving into an intermediate stage where the enunciation of the dual natures of Christ is difficult and not standardized. So here's where we're going to kind of segue to the next class, which is trying to figure out how we want to talk about Christ and how we want to talk about the two natures of Christ. How is it that, God, that Christ is God and he is man both at the same time? So here's an, ex here's an example of that kind of confusion. Uh, Alexander, I forget where he was the bishop of, um, he says that uh, always God, always the Son. At the same time, the Father at the same time the Son. So he's saying that God always was, and the Son always was, and the Father at the same time was always the Father, and at the same time the Son was always the Son. But you can see how in these statements it sounds kind of modalistic. It's kind of, di it's kind of difficult to, s to see where the uh, division between the two is coming in. And so the division and yet unity at the same time. Um, so this is where Arius comes in, and there's, um, there's Nicholas punching Arius in the face. <laughs> and I, 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 you know, I didn't look for it, so I don't know where this is coming from in church history, but as the story goes, as I've heard it, and I don't know, it, I'm assuming this is coming from Eusebius of Caesarea because he, uh, he's considered our first church, true church historian, and he was there at the Council of Nicaea. Um, but... As I've heard it anyway, what basically happens was is they did it like a courtroom setting where one person presented their case and the other person presented their case. Well, Arius got done presenting his case, and Nicholas stood up and walked over to him and slapped him in the face and then sat back down. And then he was kicked out of the council. <laughs> they all agreed with him, but uh, they said that's not Christian behavior, and so they removed him. Um, I, there's this hilarious meme that's online. It always pops up at Christmas time, and it's a, it's a picture. It's a Greek icon of um, Nicholas, and it says, "I've come here to bring president to bring presents and slap heretics." And I just ran out of presents. <laughs> so yeah, he, uh, good old Saint Nick, defender of the Trinity. Um, so Arius is living in about two fifty to three thirty. Uh, he was a priest in Egypt. What's that? What's that? Oh, in the truth. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah seriously, huh? Yeah, we struggle with things like, um, should we say Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays? They struggle with um, how do we refer to the deity of Christ. Um, it's said at this time that it was such a big thing, that it was such a huge deal for the whole of the Roman Empire, because Christianity it had been accepted by this time. Constantine was emperor. Um, it said that it was so prolific that if you went to buy bread, you would go to the bread maker and say, I would like a loaf of bread. And he would respond with, um, the son proceeds from the father and is separate and distinct from him. You would go to the winemaker and you would ask for wine and he would say, the son is consubstantial with the father. And it, so I mean, it, was, it was very much a part of their culture. And you just, you know, you think about the things that we struggle with and what they're struggling with at that point. It's like, oh boy. <laughs> um, so Arius was, uh, one of the interesting things about Arius, and this always gets brought up about Arius, is that he 
was all about putting things to rhyme and putting things to song. Um, and they actually had like a, there's a, there was a disruption during the council because his people were singing and were causing problems because they would put all their theology to song and they would sing these jingles. Um, and I don't know if anybody else has ever done that, but he was apparently very successful with it. He was also, um, uh, Eusebius said that he, or oh, it was Philip Schaff that I was reading. Schaff said that he was, uh, he was a very arrogant man, which you're going to see in a second here. This is one of his jingles. Arius of Zal Alexandria, I'm the talk of the town, friend of saints, elect of heaven, filled with learning and renown. You want the Logos doctrine? I can serve it steaming hot. God begat him, and before he was gotten, he was not. I so just, they would. I can't imagine them saying steaming hot and I'm the talk of the town. I know, isn't that funny? <laughs> it's so <laughs> funny. The first time I heard that, I was like, this sounds like something someone would sing nowadays, you know? It's so funny. Things change, and yet they just don't change at all. <laughs> right. Um, so uh, Arius is coming out of this, and he's hearing things like this, and he's, um, he's going, this sounds like there's two gods here. We can't have that. And so he wants to deny... Arius is going to deny the, um, the deity of Christ, and he's going to say that... <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself again. Uh, I have a habit of doing that. Um, the Council of Night. So uh, Arius is uh, struggling with us, and he's got his people, and they're causing problems in the Roman Empire, and so Constantine calls the Council of Nicaea because Constantine's a good politician, and he, uh, this is where we're starting to see the separation between church and state is kind of going away and the two are kind of coming together. And so Constantine, being a good politician, does not want his empire divided. And so he calls this and is basically saying, you guys need to settle this. And in reality, he's a politician. Was he a Christian? Maybe. He switched sides. He was an Arian. Uh, supposedly he recanted of Arianism, but maybe, maybe not. So he kind of... He went along with the council, and then as the rest of the world moved to Arianism, he went with them. So, you know, he was, he was the emperor, and that's about all you can say about him. Um, there are supposedly 318 bishops. There are different accounts. Uh, I heard that, where was it? Um, that this actually, that, that number actually was attributed to Genesis 30, 31.8. I don't remember. I, don't, I didn't have it written down. I only, heard, I only heard it in one source. I forget what it was, though. But they say that that 318 might have actually come from a biblical reference that had to do with um, the number of... Uh, yeah, it would have been Genesis. I think it was Genesis 31a because it was the number of people that were in Abraham's camp. Um, but uh, at, at the Council of Nicaea, the big issue here is two Greek words, homoousios and homoousios. Uh, same essence versus similar essence. And so... Um, what, the, what the Orthodox want to say is that Christ is consubstantial with the Father. He is this, of the same essence as the Father. They are one God, one in being. And what some of the other people are saying, what some of the Arians are saying, and what, they're, what some of the people who are kind of in the middle, who are on the borderline, they're trying to draw this, like, let's meet in the middle. And so they're saying of similar essence. And so they say, now this is, uh, this is kind of funny, but have you ever heard the term not one iota? So something very, very small comes from this because the only difference between these two words is one iota. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but it's possible that that's true. Um, so uh, yeah, same essence versus similar essence. And the Orthodox said absolutely not on this similar essence. So that got shot down. Um, so Arianism, what exactly is Arianism teaching? Uh, they're teaching that God the Father, only God the Father, is God. Uh, the Son is a creation. He's preeminent, firstborn over creation. So, yeah, Jehovah's Witnesses, are they are Arian through and through. Um, through the Logos is the world created once again. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are following this. Um, described to Jesus, or describe, ascribe to Jesus a true human body but not a rational soul. So this is one of the distinctions that we're going to see next week as we go into what is the relationship between 
the humanity and the divinity of Christ, which is, is did, did the Logos just kind of fill a human body? Did the body have its, was it a person? If you separated Jesus' humanity from his divinity, would the humanity exist as a, just like one of us, just a normal human? Um, was his will the same as the Logos, or was there only one will? Uh, these questions are all coming out of this as to what are we going to do with this doctrine now? How do we want to explain this? Um, he ascribed to Jesus a human body, but not a rational soul. So the, uh, the pre-incarnate Logos is going to fill the human body, and his faculties are going to come from his divinity and not, a, not um, on the part of his humanity. Uh, so what was the re result of Nicaea? Uh, Nicaea landed on orthodoxy. However, the world woke up and found itself Arian. And we're going to, this is a segue, so we're going to begin next week still talking about the Arian controversy, but it's going to be post-Nicaea Arianism. So we'll start with Athanasius uh, next week, and then we'll move from there. Athanasians uh, contended for Nicene Orthodoxy. I think I mentioned once before that he got kicked out of his church five times and uh, kept coming back. Uh, there's a story that he was actually on the run because there were persecutions going on at this time. Uh, any, anytime some group got labeled as, a her as heretical, they got persecuted. Uh, when Christianity got instituted, what did the Christians do to the pagans? They just flip-flopped, and now all that the persecutions of the pagans had been put on the Christians. Christians are now doing to the pagans. Arians were persecuting the Orthodox. And it just, like, people just don't ever learn. Um, uh, Orthodoxy was the reinstituted Council of Constantinople. Oh, I, I got off. Uh, there is a story that um, Athanasius was actually running away because he got condemned again, and he was on his way away from whatever city it was from. He was in a boat. And a bunch of people caught up. What's up? Uh, a bunch of people caught up to him, and they asked him, "Have you seen Athanasius?" And he said, "He's not far from here." And they took off and went the other direction, <laughs> which uh, obviously he wasn't far from here because he was himself. So he didn't lie, but he didn't tell the truth either. But he saved his hide, and we're thankful for it. Um, and so we're going to end there. Uh, next time we'll pick up with um, post Nicene. Arianism, and then we'll get into um, the issues relating to uh, the uh, relationship between the divinity and the humanity of Christ, which I've heard very smart people say, if you understand it, then props to you, because no one understands these things. It's just difficult. Um, so uh, let's close in prayer then. Lord, we thank you for this day, and uh, Lord, we thank you for this day, and we just thank you that you could bring us all here today. Um, I just... Um, Pray for our church, Lord, and pray for the decisions that we're going through right now. Uh, just uh, pray for everyone here and um, give everyone a uh, spirit of community and also a, uh, a spirit of um, uh, discernment, as your Apostle Paul calls for the mature to have uh, and, and the spiritual to have. I just pray that your uh, Holy Spirit will uh, guide us in our decisions as we go forward as to what we're to do with our church. Um, I just uh, thank you for the grace that you've shown us in meeting here together and to be uh, with each other as a part of this community. And I just pray that that continues. And um, I just pray for uh, um, Pastor Frank today and just pray that you'll speak through him. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. <laughs>